Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life. Well, it is 10, uh, 31, 10 hours and 31 minutes into, uh, yeah, no, 10 hours and 41 minutes into the 31st day of October, near the end of October 31st anyways, uh, in terms of the day. Uh, but this is how it works. Uh, I have time to film now, and so that's when I'm going to do it. We're going to begin our vlog getting looking at LARPs and works and moving on to a, a, a call, something called target assessment. And this has to do a lot, a lot again, it, it, this is uh, observational work. It, it, it takes a, a fair bit of observation to do this. But what happens is, what happens is, is it takes a while for people to understand how things end up working, particularly if they're not going to be doing this on a daily basis. So my issue is, how do you bring something more complex down to the average viewer, down to the average person? Well, this means if it's only doing a half hour, well, that means I have to spend, if, it, if, the, if there is a complex topic, and I want to bring you in deeper, then I'm going to have to do more than one episode on that one particular topic because there is more required. So you're going to see... In many cases, a repeat of the title that only gives you some of the suggestions of what's going to actually going to be in there. And then this is where you say, oh, I've already seen that. Well, no, because we're going to be doing a little bit more depth uh, into what we've been talking about. And this will allow you to sort of get along further. And the two references that uh, I want to sort of impart in here is uh, our... Uh, Jeeves and Worcester, uh, Monsignor Coyote. These are two particular works. I'm just going to leave those there for now. Two particular works that have a political message in them, but done in such a manner that it's very difficult to understand there is a political message there, but there is. Particularly Jeeves and Worcester. Jeeves and Worcester is an excellent commentary on the way things were. Uh, and this is from around the turn, around the time of uh, just about 1900, just around 10 years before, like 1980, uh, 1880, I should say, 1880 to 18 uh, to 19, 1910, just around that time. There, this is sort of what we're looking at in terms of the time period. Uh, it can get be a, li a little bit longer than that, but not much in terms of the uh, uh, being later than. I don't think it. I think it may be around the time of. Uh, before the war, uh, the the World War World War One, that would be Woodward Wilson. I think that would be 1915, around there, uh, from my recollection. I'll have to go back into my notes and sort of check these things. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'm waiting for. Well, actually, I'm watching uh, another vortex come into uh, into my area. It's coming in from the southwest. And it should be just situated over us now. Mm. And the vortex creates an enormous amount of wind. Now, we haven't had any trains coming. I, I haven't heard any trains. Yeah, but then it's a little too early for the trains. Because usually they're around uh, 11, between 11.30 and 12.30. That's when the trains come through. Right now, everybody's kind of off. Everyone's got the sort of the Halloween holiday uh, sort of vibe going on. Uh, and while most people sort of do their thing, and Lionel was certainly off today, I don't know what he did, but uh, we'll find out tomorrow. Uh, this is going into the whole concept of what he calls the work. The work is based on the script developed by uh, wrestlers the, in the sort of the, you know, the different wrestling, uh, the WWF, all, all the different wrestling sort of... Uh, Creations, and it is a scripted work. It's a scripted work, but the problem is, and this is where a large chunk of the conspiracy theorists get things a little uh, mixed up, is that the works don't necessarily have to be exactly scripted. And this is what I was talking about: control agents. A control agent can bring in agents, blind agents, or sub-agents. Because some of the agents, they could be blind, but they don't have to be necessarily blind. But they do things that make them rogue. 
that the uh, a higher up could not approve of, even though this is what they wanted. And so they were, oh, we weren't responsible, but this was a rogue element. Well, did it help you? <laughs> did, you did you get what you wanted out of it? Or some of what you wanted out of it? And this was what sort of let you know that, that well, okay, these are rogue elements, but at the same time is that they were known about, they were controlled to a certain degree, and the rogue elements were allowed to sort of behave the way they behave. This could be argued of ISIS. ISIS would be the uh, it would be an example of the sort of controlled rogue agent. So what happens is these people are like the improv people. They're, 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 this we call improv uh, is improvisation. Improv, improvis, improvisation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Improvisate. Uh, can't get it. Improvisation. I uh, can't get it. But it, these, these are. Because, they improv. They, they is impromptu. It, it's uh, done without a script. It, it's done right on the spot. That this is uh, they call it, call it ad libbing. Uh, and actually, it doesn't have to be one. Uh, oh. Let me get my thoughts organized. Second City and uh, Saturday Night Live, which came out of Second City is an example of improv where the, the, the actors don't necessarily practice the stuff out beforehand, but simply take suggestions on term, in terms of a storyline, and then they build from there. The, the script is built from the initial storyline, uh, but there are, is no actual script. It, has, it depends on the quality of the actor in order to pull off a successful improv to make you believe that it was scripted. And this goes in he pretty heavily with you look, go back and to look at the at Orson Welles. This is another point you need to look up. Orson Welles was a radio actor. Before TV, there was radio. And he put on a radio play based on the book or H.G. Uh, uh, Wells' uh, War of the Worlds. This is should be something that, that if, if you're interested in what's going on today in terms of the lockdown, Go one read or H. G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and then go look up Orson Welles in relationship to it. It's going to be an eye opener to say that oh, this has never happened before. Read the book, then 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 listen to the radio play done by Orson Welles, and you will find that this was not the first time. That this had been done before. That this is something pulled from the archives, if you will, and brought forward. Uh, uh, into our current uh, understanding, of it. and if you're if you're uh, say uh, into UFOs, as, as, you know, let's call it as a conspiracy theory right now because we haven't gotten that deep into it. So when we talk about conspiracy theories, we're talking about the surface. We haven't gone into the actual understandings of things, possible understanding. Now, as I said before, I will not be releasing certain information. I have certain information that. Is, well, very sensitive, and it is not for release at this particular point in time. If I do find a point in time to release it, I will release it. Uh, the description of the flying saucer came from H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. At the particular point in time that H.G. H. G. Wells uh, wrote the, the book, uh, there was this was the beginning of early telescopes. And one of uh, the astronomers who have been looking at the uh, at Mars was able, and he was, they didn't have photographs back then, so they sketched what they saw. And they thought they saw, uh, these astronomers thought they saw uh, lines on, on Mars, say, oh, these are canals, there definitely is a civilization there. And they would come over with flying saucers. This is where the term flying saucer actually came from. And the it was an invasion. It was an invasion by Mars to take over the planet. And it was quite a horrible tale. And then Orson Welles took this, I think it was 1935, thereabouts, and put this on the radio. But he didn't do it as a play. He did it as a reality thing, as, as if this was actually real. 
people couldn't tell the difference. They didn't know that it was a play, even though maybe they somebody had read, read the books. And, so, and there was mass panic all across the United States because this guy was nationally syndicated. This was, I think, it was on NBC or CBS. I can't remember which one it was. That this, this is when NBC, ABC, uh, uh, CBS. These were all radio channels. They were national radio networks. They weren't TV yet. Uh, and it panicked everybody. It, everyone was panicked. They even called out the Army. The Army and the National Guard were called out to deal with the invasion of, of, of Earth, by, and particularly the United States, uh, by, uh, by Martians. And they pulled out all their artillery. They pulled, you know, and, and they, they created a curfew and so on and so forth. And while this whole thing was going on, there was mass panic going on. This is the nature of a work. The nature of a work is to elicit some form of reaction in your audience. This is what horror movies do. This is uh, Halloween. This is uh, the only horror movies. Halloween, uh, Freddy, uh, uh, Freddy. Uh, I can't remember what it's not. What it is. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, it's also. Uh, Chucky, the doll, Chucky. There, that, that's the one, one of the uh, the, the uh, that's one of the uh, horror movies. These movies are created to create fear, and in some cases, they also create panic. This is what happened with the, this is what happened with the uh, the movie The Exorcist. People were freaking out in the theater because they couldn't handle what they were seeing and what they were feeling in the movie. They couldn't handle what was on the screen. They couldn't handle the the, the uh, the emotions that were coming from it, and as they brought it in, it pushed them over a particular edge, and they started going crazy and insane in the aisles. None of the stuff is out of the sight of people who specialize in psychological warfare. And the manual on psychological warfare came through with this guy, Edward Bernays. He is the key to this. His uncle was Sigmund Freud. Now, people are always talk about Jung, right? You listen to Peter jo uh, Jordanson, uh, or Jordan Peterson, I can't remember what his name is. He's always, a, he's always talking about Jung, amaz the amazing Jung. Jung was a distraction to pull people away from Freud. You've got to understand that these things, the, 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 you have a work and then you have a counter work. A work will tell you how to feel one thing, one way. And then you'll have another work over here that will distract you from the reality of what's going on. So this is, you start seeing something going on, and they don't want to. They want to distract you. They'll create an issue. The issue will be created simply to pull your attention away from what's actually going on. And this was talked about many times by Lionel about how there are distractions that are going on. He uses his sense of work, his sense of improv, or in many cases, live action role play, because that's what it is. It's live action role play. For those of you who know LARP, and those of you who know uh, anime cons, uh, those of you who know who, uh, what cosplay is, this kind of all feeds into this. But what happens is you can get players who come into this game, if you will, who are there to shift political thought. And these are your agent provocateurs, or, or, or agent provocateur. They're there to, to shift the crowd in one direction or another. They're control agents. Some of the control agents will be understand what's going on, understand that this is a work. Well, others, as control agents, can be blind agents. Blind agents can, can be control agents, depending on the capacity of this particular blind agent. Now, the blind agent doesn't know what's going on, has no understanding of what's going on, but believes in the cause, believes in the ideology, and wants to bring the ideology forward. And so he was willing to go, you know, if someone suggests to him, well, you know, if you want to really make an impact, then you need to go and do this. Well, what is what's this? Is? Well, what is this? You know, the defining the, you can define it more specifically, but the thing is, we're going to do a general definition and then get into some of the understanding of it. Uh, the general understanding of this is targeted Analysis or target analysis. 
who is your target? How do they behave? What do they think? How do they act? And then, then the fifth part, the fifth part is how do you move them? And this is the game th same thing with red pilling and being woke and stuff. How do you move a person from where they are to where you want them to be? What mechanisms will need to come into play? And this is how an agent provocateur or a control agent will get into a particular crowd and start shifting and pushing the crowd in another direction or, or a direction that they want, want the crowd to go in. Without the crowd, without the crowd realizing that they're being pushed, that they're being herded. And that's actually the term is called herding. It's H E R D I N G herding. Like you're herding a, a group of cattle. As a matter of fact, this was uh, Sigmund Freud, who was the uncle of Edward Bernays. This was his entire phrase calling the human beings the bewildered herd who can be moved by certain influences. In, they could be herded in one direction or another. And this is where they understood as well at the same time that the crowd, the people, could be a weapon. You can weaponize this. This is why you never hear anything like this coming out of uh, any of your, your major textbooks who talk about psychology. They permit particularly focusing on Jung, because Jung never talked about this. Jung never talked about turning the crowd into a weapon. It's only from Freud and Edward Bernays that you start beginning to understand they're talking about turning the crowd, who they view as a herd of animals, into a weapon. How do you stampede a crowd into a particular, let's say, country? Oh, an example here would be Euromaidan. Look at look at what happened in Ukraine. You, the whole Ukrainian situation was Edward Bernays and Sigmund Freud's concept of the herd, where they turned the crowd into a weapon. What was the weapon used in Ukraine? The people were using the crowd. What did you see on, uh, on, on 2000, 2020, the election there? The people became the weapon. But this is missed by most people. And the thing is, Lionel hasn't mentioned a word about this. The question is, is that of the things we don't see about Lionel, where does he stand? Lionel could be very true in terms of his feelings about Trump or about being independent. But at the same time, he may have influences within his group that he calls his friends that will come up to him, be his friend, be his buddy, and then feed him information that will shift him into their position. In other words, he's being... He's being herded. He's not entirely red pill. This is why I say it take in many cases it takes many red pills in order to be red pilled. And this is giving an example, we'll go into a more specific example of this. We'll go into Mrs. L. Mrs. L, and a lot of people have heard now uh, have heard about what her work is, even though they don't know it necessarily. The Senate hearings about big tech. On and on and on. You've heard his, you've heard Lionel's feelings and views on YouTube. Direct, horrible, you know, once upon a time good, but bad right now. What's their views? They're not stopping trial, child trafficking. They, they, they have to be held accountable. Now, he's also talked about Disney Plus and how DC is now bringing in this woke information this woke type of script into their shows aimed specifically at children. So what's happening? As YouTube and Facebook are being knocked off, this is what we're seeing now, this whole thing, this whole hearing thing was spearheaded by Mrs. L. They're now herding the children. Again, Edward Bernays herding, like a herd of cattle. They're herding them into Disney Plus, Nick Plus, and a whole bunch of other Hulu, a bu whole bunch of streaming services that all have the woke message in it. So they're moving them from potential predators on YouTube, Facebook, and so on and so forth into real predators of Disney, Nickelodeon, that's Universal Studios, and the like. Because we understand the history of what Disney is. All you have to do is go back to the time of Shirley Temple. Go search, do a search on Shirley Temple, Shirley Temple Black. Understand what happened to her. She has come out and stated that Hollywood 
is a system is, is a system of pedophilia. And again, I'm not going to go into the terms here and go get down to the, the, the minute definitions. There's no purpose to it because we all understand what we're talking about. But Mrs. L's target was completely off. Instead of moving them away into a safe position, she moved them into a dangerous position. They're moving them. They're moving. They're hurting the kids. Hurting. H-R-D. H-E-R-D-I-N-G. Not hurting. H-U-R-T-I-N-G. Like beating and hurting. Them. They're hurting. H-E-R-D-I-N-G. Them into the new streaming services uh, offered by Disney and the major major corpor- major uh, uh, media corporations. In other words, they're helping the big predators, the ones who are way beyond the law. These people will not be brought into the court. All you have to do is look. With, uh, Harvey Firestein was simply Harvey 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 Weinstein was simply a sacrificial lamb. They threw the dog a bone. That's what he was. But we know there's a lot more going on inside of Hollywood. This is all talked about this on a regular basis. I went and found. I found. I, I looked at her Twitter channel. I looked at her. Uh, she's got a YouTube channel. I found it. I started watching. And they're talking about that. She goes on a lot about what Hollywood is doing. And so, it's, but instead of going after Hollywood, she went after the the messaging services, services the the, the uh, social media services, which keep people off of Disney. When these search services are gone, the kids go back on to Disney. They're hurt. She's moving them from the social media into the worst position of being within the major media corporations that which are known to be uh, supporting pedophilia. And this is what the, mo- the woke message is. And you can find this if you do a search on Raelians uh, and uh, the guy he put up, uh, he put this guy up, he put, and it was Lionel did this. He put up a picture and says, who is this? Well, he put up a picture on Twitter of a guy named Rajneesh. Go look at the cults, the cults from 1970 and see what they're about. You'll find the open sexual message. You'll find this open sexual message that includes children. They talk about sexual health. And you'll find everything you're talking about in this sexuality thing. One, in the school system in terms of what they call it, the, the, the health, health education. And then two, you'll find this in the woke message, particularly in what you're getting and get, get what you're getting now from Walt Disney, from uh, uh, from Universal Studios. All the woke stuff is there, and she's herding them into this particular direction. She's moving the kids into there. This is why target assessment needs to be done. In your in your set, oh, I'm going to set this target. Okay, well, how effective are you going to be in this? What is the end result once you have done this targeting and start moving these people into this direction? Do you want to put put more kids in Hollywood or do you want to put less kids in Hollywood? Particularly understanding the history of Hollywood and sexual predation. I said, if you're going all the way back to Shirley Temple for the sexual predation, and it's still it was been reported as, you know, Corey Hames was the 80s and the 90s. And it was still even beyond that. Like, Harvey Weinstein was was uh, 1990, uh, 2000. So you've got a history, uh, a, a very long history. You have, I want to say, let's say uh, from Hollywood, because they all talk about Charlie Chaplin, which was the silent movie in his uh, issues. Uh, so you're going back, I mean, maybe 1915, let's say 1920 to give us round numbers. And we're still talking about it in the current sense in 2000, then to 2020, still. So, 1920 to 19 to 2000 is 80 years. Add another 20 years to the 80 years, we're talking about 100 years. There has been a, se- a century of Hollywood sexual predation of children that is being ignored, and she's target. She's in her targeting. She didn't see this. Or either ignored it, and is now hurting the children that she wants to protect into Disney, Disney particularly Disney Plus, uh, Nickel, Nick Plus, and to into the streaming services 
of the major corporations that run Hollywood. She's putting them, these kids, into the arms of the biggest predators there are. Google has the potential for predators. Same thing with most social media. There is the potential. But if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that the kids who are being trafficked aren't being trafficked from Facebook or from these services. They're being marketed on it. The marketing is going on there. Again, you can follow what's going on, and a lot of times it's coming from modeling. Go from a dancer. They, you see that? Go look at the dancers. Follow the dancers, the, the, the kids who are dancing. Follow them into gymnastics. Follow them into modeling, and you'll see what happens as the career moves along. You'll see it right there, and it's right in front of us. This targeting was completely missed. She hit the medium, but not the target itself. This is why target assessment, in terms of understanding the work, understanding what a LARP is, understanding what these different things, this is why it's important. And the thing is that the GOP really does want to get America back. You want to get into a better position, then you have to understand how to target things, how to make the, how to assess a target in, in, in the best manner possible so you have the best possible outcome. Don't do this. If you don't do this, you're not going to have any effect. Anyways, uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, I've said my bit, said my piece, and uh, it's now time to sort of sit and just sort of relax a little bit <laughs> for another hour out here, and then I'll go in uh, probably around 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Anyways, see you then. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life.